With postgraduate qualifications in both the arts and sciences, Catherine works at the interface of the studio and lab, the archive, library and the museum gallery, combining visual and forensic art techniques with curatorial methods to explore truth-making in relation to narratives of violence, crime and trauma in her research-based practice. Originally from South Africa, she joined LGMU's Face Lab as a doctoral research student and graduate teaching assistant in 2015 on leave from her post as Programme Lead for Fine Arts in the Department of Visual Arts at Stellenbosch University, where she holds a senior lectureship. Her doctoral project explores the role of forensic art in representing the dead across international investigatory and media sites, and the additional affordances and challenges, ethical and practical, of counter-forensic, citizen-led initiatives in digital and online culture. Catherine's talk today is titled Strange Attractors or Just a Drunken Conversation. Sci art, art sci, and any permutation of this binary relationship has become almost inescapable in research and education over the past decade or so. More recently, the STEAM agenda has powered into educational policy. But what do these formulations do? How do they produce meaning? And is their language really translatable across knowledge systems? Considering Catherine's contributions, the development and delivery of the MA Art and Science programme at LGMU from its inception in 2016, embodied by the perception machine itself, Catherine will be thinking through recent formulations and criticisms of a curious relationship between art and science and what this entanglement might afford. Okay, hi. Thanks very much everyone for coming. Um, what I sort of suggested I would talk about this evening is um, what we're seeing sort of grammatically, these kind of conjunctions of sci-art, art-sci, and any permutation of um, these binary relationships have become almost inescapable in sort of current research and education over the past decade or so. Um, and more recently, the STEAM agenda, so that's putting art back into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, has sort of powered into educational policy and I've been curious about what these formulations do. So my position this evening is sort of talking to you as someone involved in this art and science program and how I've been trying to think through um, these ideas more recently in the last sort of two to three years but also what I've brought with me from you know a 20 year sort of work environment where art and science have always occupied a kind of equal space in my attention, but the kind of, um, how shall we say, the sort of defining it as a field, which I don't think it is, and that's my disclaimer <laughs> before, um, before we even start. In the South African context, it doesn't, this, this sort of conversation about art and science is not happening in the same way. So. Um, what I'm going to do this evening is sort of take you through some of the ideas that have sort of helped shape my thinking, um, for better or for worse, over um, the past couple of years, as I said. So I'm interested in how these two ideas, putting them together in whichever formulation we're putting them together, how they produce meaning, and is their respective languages or grammars really translatable across um, these, what I understand as knowledge systems. So my current thinking is that categories of art and science per se are not useful. Um, I think they act as a shorthand or kind of signposting, which can be useful. Um, and, and also interested to think about what we denote, what we call science might in fact denote technology and vice versa, and how we sort of understand technology, technologies in relation um, to science. But also what do we mean when we, when we talk about art? because we all have probably quite different ideas about what art is, what it can encompass. Um, and would non-specialists, for example, non-art specialists, know the difference between, say, modernism and post-conceptualism when you're walking around an art gallery? Would we be able to, um, to distinguish those and what that means? I will talk about the title of the talk in a second and where that comes from. So, as Mark said, I came here from um, Cape Town and Stellenbosch University specifically about three years ago. This is what Stellenbosch looks like, very bucolic. Um, very much not a picture of contemporary South Africa on the face of it. Um, and I left the campus just as a lot of um, highly politicised and quite violent protests were breaking out um, across the campus. But just to show you that I moved between that very sort of Cape Dutch architecture of the Visual Arts Building and this extremely mo modern um, 
medical health sciences faculty, um, which is in a sort of slightly different part of town. So this was an unusual place to, um, yeah, the dynamic of moving between these different geographies and different spaces, different kind of knowledge sites, if you will, often required, and I'm, I'm surprised by it, so I'm mentioning it, often required not only explanation but also justification for why you move between these two um, spaces. This is a headline from a fairly recent article in Scientific American. Um, and I don't know if I agree. <laughs> this is part of, um, part of the conversation. But certainly on Twitter, for example, if any of you are engaging in social media, um, SciArt hashtags are extremely popular and it's what, we often, what we're looking at, um, at when we are engaging students, certainly. Um, but it does talk about online spaces as a, a platform for communication where perhaps these boundaries that we would think of as sort of disciplinary boundaries are operating in an entirely different way, if at all. So, what I'd like to say about some of these ideas that I'm going to share with you, and the ideas that are, like I said, not mine, um, we've been privileged over the last couple of years to attend a couple of um, really insightful um, and, and also provocative um, events, um, two of which um, I'll get to um, that I'm going to focus on specifically. Um, one is um, a lecture which you can listen to online, and this goes to the title of my talk by um, an, an ex-art historian called James Elkins, um, extremely prolific um, as a writer, as an experimental writer, but his oeuvre is very much um, concerned with perception um, in broad strokes, and James will probably watch this online, so hi Jim, and I apologise if I'm making a hash. <laughs> Uh, a hash of your, of your practice, but on the one hand, um, a lecture that he gave, which I'll get to in a second, and on the other hand, um, a symposium we were, um, that was hosted last year at the Welcome Collection um, called Post Art and Science. So as much as the conversation is still very, seems to be very current, in the field there's already a sense that this is actually a 10-year-old conversation, maybe this conversation's quite tired and we're already moving into a post art and science moment, a little bit like post photography um, or post conceptualism. But I think what's important to say is these ideas as I sort of understand them and, and I find it very difficult to sort of position myself in a fixed way in relation to um, art and science both in theory and practice is that these ideas are restless, they're equivocal and definitely to hold on to the idea that they're non-binary. I think that's really important. Um, especially in terms of definition, um, defining this as a field which like I've said I don't, I don't think it is. Um, but through various platforms and conversations, we've started to recognize confluences, I would say, of interests, um, sensibilities, and perhaps even personal and political affordances. Um, so seeing how others have identified and named these coordinates um, seems to be a good place to start to kind of take, a, take stock, perhaps, of are we on the same page about these things? So, James Elkins, um, his practice is very interesting because he also does not um, obey the kind of, I don't know, conventions of the, of the academic publishing world. So he does a lot of experimental writing online, a lot of collaborative writing on Google Docs. So if you go to his website, you'll find, um, this is just a snapshot of one of, his page, of one of the pages, Aesthetics and the Two Cultures, Why Art and Science Should Be Allowed to Go Their Separate Ways. So I'm going to be focusing um, on a lecture that, like I said, is available on YouTube if you want to watch it. And then this was the um, Post Art and Science Symposium at Welcome, which was um, hosted by GV Art, which is a gallery in London that specializes in work that operates um, at the interface um, between art and science. So I'm not getting the, the left hand um, click of this mouse. So these are some, I just thought this was interesting to kind of look back at this symposium. So these were, people were live tweeting at this um, symposium at, um, at the Welcome Collection. And from this collection of tweets, you can kind of get a sense of some of the themes that emerge. And it's probably too small um, for you to read. But from these, from these tweets, we're getting a sense of some of the kind of broader themes of this ongoing conversation. So definition, what is art, what is science? What are the um, dynamics of collaboration? How do we each understand um, what collaboration is? 
How important is scientific accuracy in artistic creations? Um, one person asked. Does being an artist and using art as research allow an artist to fail in a way that a scientist couldn't? So now I'm not saying that these are things one necessarily would agree with, but they're certainly provocations um, for conversation. Um, I really like this comment by, um, is it Brian Glazer? I don't remember his name now. Daniel Sorry, Daniel Glazer, B.N. Glazer. Um, he's the director of the science room. Interdisciplinarity is not so much about sharing knowledge than it is about tolerating ignorance. So as artists and scientists working together, how do we feel about that, you know, holding sort of that relationship? Um, We'll, um, Daniel Glaze will argue what we need to do is periodically engage in an interdisciplinary way, but we need to use disciplines to support this. So that position is saying, yes, we, we need to sort of work across um, disciplines, but we actually also need to hold on to our disciplinary um, specificities, our disciplinary knowledge. Um, and then, you know, a, another attitude, surely this interesting space is where we don't label things art or science and remove preconceptions of either discipline. So people are kind of all over um, negotiating these various um, coordinates. Ethics in science versus ethics in art. There's some sense that artists are perhaps more free to do certain things and scientists are not in the same way. Every collaboration is different and ownership um, issues, etc., need to be dealt with. So that's about you know, authorship and collaboration. And I'll sort of end off with considering some of these sort of political um, political ideas where art and science collaborations, however post-art and science we might be, that will become increasingly important to science communications in a post-truth landscape. So this idea of truth construction and the role of art and science in how we understand what truth is and what objectivity is, I think, is um, an interesting question. So to move on to James Elkin's proposing eight models of art science interactions. These are not them. This is his map of thinking through how do we understand practice. So artists who use science in their practice, artists in residence in museums, artists accompanying um, expeditions, art historians working on scientific themes, etc. He, so he's kind of taken a survey of historical relationships of artists and science, um, artists and scientists working together. But these are his models, and I'm going to talk through them um, sort of one by one, not in too much detail because we don't have that much time, but I think it's important to kind of just pay attention to what he's saying here. So this lecture that he gave, he bracketed the time period 1959 to 2017, taking the publication of C.P. Snow's very famous essay, The Two Cultures and the scientific revolution as a starting point and taking it through to, to the present. Elkins identifies um, the sort of art and science conversation as a topos. Um, he says there's an extensive bibliography in existence, this two cultures idea is a topos. There's an extensive bibliography, it's kind of an exhausted conversation. And he's less interested in the idea of two cultures as he is in two grammars. So he introduces this idea as two separate grammars that um, art and science function in. Um, using Snow's idea of this mutual intelligibility um, always turns on a, on a lack of rudimentary knowledge. So we don't really understand the kind of founding principles or the basics of each other's respective disciplines. So how do we then have um, a conversation? Um, this idea that art and science share aesthetics, so ideas around beauty, and the sublime, other words, um, elegance and pattern, are things that are sort of common in the sort of visual cultures um, of both. Um, he quotes an essay by Leo Steinberg, which is available online, about whether these two ideas should in fact be yoked together. Um, but really, what he's talking about here is, do we use words in the same way? And not just words for their meaning, but the values that we associate with these words. Are we on the same page about what beauty means, for example, and what elegance means? With this idea of a third culture, um, the third culture is tracked back to an essay by Victoria um, Vesna in 2001, which was published in Leonardo, um, and she identifies a triangulation, as she calls it, between art, science, and the humanities, but also art, science, and technology, and uses these sort of triangulations interchangeably. 
Fourth idea is that art and science are not just two cultures, they're in fact many cultures. Um, but what Elkins points out with this idea is that when you sort of define science and art separately, you automatically introduce or you begin a process of fragmentation and categorization into technologies on the one hand and media and on the other, in terms of how we think about um, the sort of practices of these disciplines. The fifth is what actually you'll see on our blackboard outside for the perception machine is this Venn model, Venn diagram model of art and science collaboration. Um, Roger Molina talks about shared traits of personality and cognitive strategy. Um, and as Elkins points out, this takes many forms. It's kind of like an armature um, or an intersection. Um, and that the sort of transmission of information is a sort of common principle between both. Hybridity or convergence, um, things like synthesis, um, Frankensteinian grafting, all of these kinds of ideas um, are, is often sort of common language that's used um, to talk about the, the dynamics of these collaborations. Creativity, this idea of like wonder and inspiration, he associates this as being common to sort of pedagogies that um, work in the space between art and science but he regards this as quite an overused and meaningless idea, um, particularly in a late capitalist sort of system, like with you know, knowledge economies and creative industries. Um, and then his idea of a drunken conversation or strange attractors, and he's quite clear that he doesn't mean this as an insult, um, just that, and I want to quote what he says, they're very fond of each other, art and science, but they don't spend, tend to speak very clearly. Out of this confused muddling, some good things can happen. So he's very clear that he doesn't mean it as a judgment, um, but that the various um, positions he outlines um, can mingle implicitly, kind of socially mingle, flirt perhaps, um, resulting in a set of open-ended practices. And I suppose this is where my interests sort of come to rest. This is his example <coughs> he uses in the lectures, the Venn diagram sort of idea, which my sense is that he, he hates, I think visually and just generally doesn't like this illustration. Um, the two artists you saw on the slide um, were, before I started to speak about this, um, Evelina Domnich and, and Dimitri Gelfland, who actually were on an exhibition at FACT last year, No Such Thing as Gravity. He regards their practice as, as kind of ideal in terms of this um, open-ended result where in fact artistic practice can also produce new science. This is a current student of ours, Raji Salan, and it's a project that she's recently done where, in fact, this has happened. So it's really exciting to be able to include this and talk about it. Um, so she's done a project looking at um, seeds of rare and endangered plants. And the images that she's produced under a scanning electron microscope has actually provoked some new thinking around the science of rare and endangered plants in the area of, um, of ecology. So. Venn diagram sort of principle again, this is the logo of Science Gallery International. So we can see these sort of visual shorthands sort of moving into the area of um, corporate identity, if you will. Marx talked a little bit about the perception machine, but just to say that what we wanted to do with this project was engage some of these, insert, some of these ideas and some of these ideas from um, James Elkins has certainly informed my thinking and some of the questions that you'll see um, in that space. These are three quotes. I don't actually, one of these things, when we attend all of these things, I take loads of notes and then often I'm not very good at sort of identifying who said them or, or where they're from. I know the very last one is the artist Nina Sellers, who said scientists are not reflexive about their own practices, whereas this is core to art. Now, that scientists might find that quite a provocative idea, and I'd be interested to know from the scientists in the room whether you would agree with that position or not. Um, and two other sort of setting up art and science again as a kind of conflict is scientists work to develop solutions for problems that should be testable or repeatable by others in order to be considered true, Artists work to invent problems that only they can solve, and in so doing, reveal particular truths. I think I'll leave it there. I have much more to say, so maybe we can take it into... Okay, one more. 
One of the things we decided to do was ask our students in the beginning of the year, how do they understand this relationship between art and science? And, you know, come with slides, do a little five-minute presentation. And I challenged myself, because I tend to sort of write at great length, I thought, well, can I reduce how I understand this relationship between art and science to some kind of graphic idea? And I ended up with this. So it's a little bit like, can you, can you publish the, your thesis as a tweet? And I thought, well, let me try and, <laughs> let me try and like, define this relationship between art and science in like a single gesture. So this is a tilde. Some of you might be familiar with them as like a modifier on top of certain letters. Um, but the tilde itself is an interesting form. So it's a, what's called a grapheme. So it's a diacritical sign. What I liked about it, especially, because then I started this whole, I sort of got obsessed with the tilde and I did a whole bunch of research. And I realized it's common to like a whole range of different fields. So written language, mathematics, computing, physics, electronics, um, and economics, all this wave form shape um, operates across all of these different fields. It's a relational operator. It talks about um, the relationships between things being relative but not exactly equivalent, and it's a modifier. So in language, it, it, it will alter how you pronounce a certain letter. Um, the key on a typewriter that allows you to add the tilde if it doesn't have it as a key is called a dead key, which I quite like this idea of like a dead space that, that also enables something else to happen. Um, it's an abbreviator, it's a range indicator. Um, what else? So many things. In ASCII art, it apparently denotes like cigarette smoke, you know. Um, it's when people mistype, it's sort of been, um, it's taken the place of an exclamation mark of people mistype, so people might say tilde, you know. And I've never heard people say this, but apparently they do. Tilde, if, if something's great. Um, and so on and so on. So there's, it's allowed me to think if we are going to talk about this art slash science, art underscore science, hashtag sci art, whatever, maybe the tilde, which is my proposition, which I'll leave um, with you this evening, um, might look something like that. <laughs> Thank you.